first want to thank, is this okay? No, it's not okay. Well, I'm going to do my best, okay? My name is Lisa Turner, and I'm with the Seminole County Sheriff's Office Pay Program. And I'm going to do my best not to use acronyms, um, because I know in law enforcement we tend to do use that a lot. Um, we're taking a picture, so sorry. Um, PAY stands for Prosecution Alternatives for Youth Program. And so before we get started with the presentation, I'm going to give a little bit of background, because I'm not sure how many people, and you don't have to raise your hand, um, know about the PAY program. But PAY actually started um, in the 80s, and it actually started as a community-based program. Much like the women in this room, much like the women in this room, there were a group of Seminole County citizens that felt it was important for victims of crimes, particularly when it comes to uh, juveniles, to have a voice, to let the kids know this is how your behaviors affected me. And that's how the PAY program actually started. And um, so it's been around since the 80s. It started as a community-based program. Then it went through to the Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, and then it actually merged with the Seminole County government once the contract was lost with DJJ. And as of two years ago, we have actually been with the Sheriff's Office, Seminole County Sheriff's Office. So we're very grateful um, to our new sheriff, um, Lima, believing in our vision for the program and it merges nicely with what he does because we have a sheriff in Seminole County who is very progressive in his thinking and really wants um, our kids to have an opportunity. So that's just a little bit about the pay program. I do ask that um, as I'm going through the presentation that you guys be just kind of go back a little bit. For some, it might have been a long time, but for others, it might not have been so long. Think about when you were, when you were an adolescent, um, what life was like prior to social media and cameras. And some of the things maybe you engaged in that you wouldn't want the people at your table to know about today. Or, um, my mom is in the house, so there might have been things that I had done that I don't necessarily want my mom, even to this day, to find out. So that's going to be the backdrop of my presentation. I do ask that you hold questions to the end. And the reason I'm kind of standing still, because I think I have a good um, aim with the system. And I hope this works for your hearing as well. And I want to say, Ms. Zelda. Oh, thank you. OK. So maybe, remember the backdrop is thinking about yourself as an adolescent, maybe you did some of this, like toilet paper, somebody's house, maybe you egged a house, maybe your kids egged a house, all in the name of fun. Maybe it was some underage drinking. I realize the drinking laws probably are a little bit different now. Or graffitied a wall. Maybe you had a schoolyard fight. Um, didn't get along with somebody in the neighborhood and got into a physical altercation. Or, this says just stopped in to say hi. Maybe you got high, you utilized some marijuana at some point. Then it was considered fun. It might have been a rite of passage. It might have been a dare to kind of tag somebody's wall just to see if you could get away with it. It might have been a schoolyard fight that maybe it was settled in a school when you got a suspension. Now, it's actually considered criminal mischief. Possession of alcohol under 21 grams. Possession of alcohol under age 21. Trespassing if you're on somebody's property and damage. Um, so either it could be criminal mischief or it could be trespassing battery of a fray. We actually have a lot of those cases with the kids for schoolyard fights. Or possession of marijuana under 21 grams. And these are a lot of the cases that we actually get through our through the pay program. And because of that, it now requires law enforcement to get involved. And that's how we begin our process with the referral to pay. So let's talk a little bit about what pay actually, who we are, what we do. 
Um, PAY um, stands for Prosecution Alternatives for Youth Program. And it can be very complicated in understanding all of the things that we do, so I tried to make it simplistic by using an umbrella. So under PAY, we, we have, it is a 90-day pretrial diversion program. We have the teen court program. Somebody was asking me in the audience about teen court. So under pay, we have teen court. We have a juvenile alternative services program called JAS. That was actually one of our first diversion programs. The, and then we have what some might know as the civil citation program. And we do other things, but I didn't, um, didn't include those today. The purpose of our program is to provide an alternative to for, um, formal court proceedings for delinquent youth. It is really to reduce the caseload of the judges. We really try to be a support system as much as we possibly can. It is to deter further involvement in the juvenile justice system. Our hope is that once our kids go through our program, they've learned a valuable life lesson and that it steers them in the right place to be able to get on the right track to be upstanding citizens. That is our ultimate goal. And because of what we do and how our program started, we want to continue to involve the community in juvenile justice. It's really important. Um, I teach one of our classes that I'll talk about a little bit later. And sometimes I think people might have a misunderstanding about our kids and that might give them a label, a long term. So it is really, we find it very helpful when the community is involved because then they really get to understand what our kids are going through and maybe sometimes even the reasons why they do what they do. Our program objectives, whether it's in teen court or whether it's civil citation or whether it's the JAF, it is to provide swift and immediate consequences. So I've raised teenagers and they don't remember a whole lot um, in a long term. So we want it to be very immediately, so once they get in trouble with the law, we try to turn those cases over and have those kids in and out within 90 days. Because if you wait, how many of you remember six months ago for a detail of something, you just, you don't remember, and it's the same thing with our kids. And for them, 90 days is a really long time. That's almost a lifetime for a lot of our kids. We want to teach them awareness and responsibility and obey the laws, not just the violation that they came in with. Some of our kids don't know that when you have a new picture in your phone, that's considered sexting and that's considered a law violation. They think it's just us going back to that beginning screen. It's just us having fun, but it's not. It is actually a law violation. So we try to educate them when they come in on um, how they might end up in trouble again if they're not careful. And then we try to assign meaningful sanctions to help them in the long run. Eligibility is really simple. It's either by referral from law enforcement or the state attorney. That's the only two ways that our kids could get in the program. And I have a lot of people say, well, the services you guys provide, the classes that you have, the kids, we really want our kids involved. And we do provide a lot, I'm proud of the work that we do, but because of the referral process, we have to narrow it down to these two referral processes. So programs that you probably are more recognizable, it is our civil citation program. And we actually started this program July 2012. And so it's been about six years, this um, in July it'll be six years we've been doing a civil citation program. And it is for committed non-serious misdemeanor offenses. They, the kids cannot have, um, well the statute has just changed, but typically there is no criminal history involved. The youth has to agree to mandatory sanctions. Once they commit, the juvenile will not have a juvenile record issued at the discretion of law enforcement and the statute that follows that is 985.12 of the Florida statutes. So um, a lot of people have a lot of questions about the civil citation program. It is one of the programs that I think is, I'm glad that they came out with it because it allows our kids to make that one time mistake and it doesn't affect them for the rest of their lives. And that is the beauty of the civil citation program. Um, we already had a process in place that has made it very easy for the pay program to um, continue to roll out the civil citation program because remember we started in the 80s so we already had a framework of how we conducted business we also had a great relationship and still do with our state attorney with our sheriff's office and so we worked so closely together it just made sense that the pay program would do the civil citation program 
So the other program that you guys are probably familiar with is Teen Court. And it was established in 1995, and it was actually by a burnt grant. And then Seminole County government decided it was a worthwhile program to continue. So we um, do Teen Court every night on Tuesday evenings up at the Seminole County Sheriff's Office um, Juvenile Justice Center building. The kids that are involved in the program are sanctioned, uh, sanctions are actually decided by their peers and Teen Court benefits the community. So you'll see that little picture. Actually, last Tuesday, we were giving away scholarships. Our um, Sheriff's Office Foundation gave away some money to some of our volunteers because it not only benefits the kids that are in the program, but the local high school students can come out and help these kids determine sanctions and help them with the process. So it is a wonderful way for it to have that peer-to-peer -peer culture. So I'm gonna talk about the volunteers in Teen Court. Um, it does allow them to get bright future scholarships for um, community service hours. And it, it gives them experience in the legal system and it promotes community involvement and it enhances public speaking. So if you ever come out to a Tuesday night, okay, let's see if I change my position, all right. Um, if you ever come out to teen court on a Tuesday night at 515, you will see a bunch of teens just kind of looking like they're hanging out but they really are conducting business. And it's, we call it um, controlled chaos. And so what happens in the courtroom, it is only one adult, and that is a volunteer. And typically they might be like Leah, they might be an attorney, um, but that is the only adult in the courtroom. And it is set up just like a courtroom system. There is um, a juvenile public defender or a defender, there is a juvenile um, prosecutor, and they're just deciding sanctions. There's actually a jury as well that's determining what the kids are gonna have to do for the next 90 days of the program. So everything is decided by teens to help other teens. Whatever program you're in, whether you're in the civil citation program, whether you're in the teen court program, this is the model we use. It's a very simple format. All of our kids have to have some type of competency class. We want them to learn um, right from wrong while they're with us. So we're teaching them skills that will build on that as they leave. We are holding our kids accountable. And then we are also concerned with, we are with the Sheriff's Department, so we are also concerned very much about public safety. So here are some of the classes that we actually offer the kids. I'm not gonna go through it. This is actually the class that I teach, which is the males class. And part of one of our roles in pay is we also reach out to the Department of Juvenile Justice, so we teach some of those kids that they come through the pay program. Um, one of the new programs we just um, rolled out is called Parenting Arise, and it is for our civil citation domestic violence cases, and cases we get from the state attorney as well, our kids can go through that. We have seen an increase in domestic violence between parent and child, and it is a unique situation because most times when they're, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker, so if I see a, a client in my office that has battery, I'm not typically dealing with the victim and um, the perpetrator, but in this situation, you have a teen who has battered their parent, and then that parent now has to take that child home. And sometimes those parents are very much afraid of their kids to discipline them. So we offer, um, and I think we're one of the few um, programs with civil citation that deals with domestic violence. And so we um, offer that as an eight-week program that allows parent and child to talk about their issues, but they're also learning communication skills and we're holding the kids accountable each week on how they're talking and dealing with their parents. And this is the accountability part. All of our kids are required through civil citation or teen court to do give back to the community. We, we want it to be meaningful, um, community service. So um, we have what's a couple roads that our kids go out for a doctor road where they clean the side of the road, but also they're working in nonprofit organizations like Goodwill and um, we have some of our volunteers that they have food kitchens. So our kids are getting in there and they're giving back. We think that is a really important part. And what's wonderful about it, if our kids do a really good job, and a lot of them do, you won't hear me say, I don't let staff always, they're bad kids. No. They made a mistake and that's how we want to treat them as though they made a mistake and a lot of our kids do end up getting employed by some of the very places that they do community service so they are good kids that have made um, some really bad decisions 
on restitution, this goes back to the crux of our program, that all of our kids, if they have damaged somebody's property, they are required to pay restitution back. And um, we give them time. Sometimes it's not always paid off in 90 days because they have to work with mom or get a job. And sometimes the parents end up having to help a little bit. But we want to make sure that the victims in this process are made whole. And we want the kids to have a real understanding of how their behavior has affected someone else. And then um, under the accountability is also the teen court because our kids that are actually in other programs, they have to volunteer, well they don't volunteer, we volunteer them, they have to um, participate in teen court as a jury to help decide sanctions. So here are our public sa safety requirements. Um, juveniles are required to follow curfew checks. Um, as far as we go out to the homes in the evening times or staff, they go out to the homes, deputies might show up at 8.30 to say, hey, are you meeting at curfew? Um, but sometimes it's also just to see how they're doing. It's not just because we're thinking that we're not out to just catch them doing things not, not correct. They have to call in uh, weekly. Kids are required to attend school and um, a restricted association of mom and dad says, well, I don't think my child should hang out with a certain person. We actually put that down on the service plan and we make sure we hold the kids accountable. If they get in trouble with someone, that they're not, then for the 90 days that they're in the program, they're not allowed to hang out with that person. And um, we do do random drug screenings and some of our juveniles are required to pay back restitution and damages. The way that we monitor our case is through case managers. We actually have um, five case managers that work with our kids. So they're in and out of the schools. They're working with other community organizations to collaborate to make sure that the kids are on track. Because when we finish these cases, we want to make sure that when we tell the state or we tell law enforcement that they're done, that they have successfully completed in all areas, not just the classes, but how, do, how are they doing in school? Because some of our kids can check off really nicely the boxes of attending classes, but then they go to the local high school and they're fighting and causing havoc on, on campus. And we want to have, see a, an improvement across the board. Here's a success story. Um, remember we were talking about scholarships. Um, the Seminole County Sheriff's Office Community Foundation um, presented, we came up with what we called a turnaround scholarship. And so this young lady received $1,000. She went to uh, Lake Brantley High School, just graduated with a 3.0, and she's going to be attending Florida A&M Mechanical University and, majored in, and will major in criminal justice. She's funny because she's already asked me if she can come back and do an internship with our office. So she was in our program. She wouldn't mind me sharing that she's very proud, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her story, not her charge. But she actually came to us in 2014. And um, she has managed to stay because that was part of the requirement. If you're going to get the turnaround scholarship, we want to make sure that you're improving, that you don't have any more negative contact with law enforcement, and that we see progression. So she's taken college classes. She's um, stayed involved at her local high school. She actually came to teen court and volunteered. And she continued to work with us because a lot of our kids, they do kind of get attached. We have great, I have a great team that I work with. So it was nice because she would come back and give her time in teen court. So now she has a $1,000 scholarship on her way to um, Florida a &M University for the turnaround scholarship. Here is our actual success in numbers. Um, I'm just going to give you the overall last year. We did about 860, 860 cases. Our overall success rate is 86%. Our recidivism, which we measure one year from the time the kids complete the program, was 9%. I'd like to see it a little lower, but 9% is not bad. And um, for our civil citation cases, we had uh, 414 cases that we did for civil citation. 89% um, of um, we finished successfully, and then 6% recidivated. And then that's just community service because we measure that. Um, I always like when I do a presentation, I think it's important if you're talking to people to ask for what you need. So here are a couple things that we're in need of. We are in need of nonprofit organizations who wouldn't mind our kids coming out to do community service. So if you know of an agency or an organization with, that wants to give back to our kids in this way, 
we would definitely appreciate it. Secondly, we're looking for community projects to get our kids involved in. Back in April, we did a, um, did a walk with our kids, uh, Mothers Against uh, Drunk Driving, and we did a food drop program over in um, Castleberry in March, where kids came out and they gave food away to those that were in need. Um, we, we just finished up an eight week um, hearing officer class, but we do need volunteers that are willing to go through the pay program, do the full background check, and also participate as a hearing officer. We didn't go into much of that program, but our community is so important to us. That's how we're able to stay afloat when we talk about doing 860 cases, you need just a little bit of help. And um, Teen Court volunteers, so if you have a grandchild or you have a child that's interested and need that Bright Future Scholarship Hour, send them our way because we're open because of what we do. We're open um, all year long, so when school closed, we're still there so they can get Bright Future Hours.